My name is Shanti Besso, and on behalf of SFU's Lifelong Learning Unit, I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. Um, I work for a program called the Community Education Program in Lifelong Learning. And uh, essentially, we work with diverse communities and partners and, and try to co-create innovative programming um, that responds to community-identified needs and, and builds new pathways into the university. Um, and tonight, we're really excited to welcome Michael Quinn Patton, together with our partners um, at Fraser Health, Mental Health and Substance Use Services, and the Drug, tri the drug Treatment Funding Program, which involves all six health authorities. And I know that um, lots of you are in the house, so thanks so much for coming. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, the David and Cecilia Ting Endowment for Public Education, which is helping to fund this event this evening. Um, I'm not going to say much more except for a couple of small housekeeping details. Uh, the washrooms are at the west side of this building, so if you go out of these doors and turn to your left, the women's is closer to us and the men's is in the far corner. Um, we will break around 8 o'clock, I think, uh, for coffee and cookies. Um, and also, uh, just a note, many of you will notice that we are videotaping this this evening. Um, just if if you are uncomfortable being taped, um, please stay behind the camera. And uh, there won't be any panning or anything like that. It's just to capture Michael's presentation, and then we'll be making it available uh, on the web at a later date. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Marika Sandrelli from Fraser Health, and uh, please welcome her. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's interesting because when we started, when we first promoted this event through SFU, um, we were looking at about 120 seats, and we thought we'd be that would be a good call. 120 seats would be fine, um, and then within a few days, 120 seats were gone. So then we decided, okay, we won't be in rounds. We'll create more seats to fill up the room. So there's 300 seats and a huge waiting list. Hence why we're filming this. So trying to explain that to my partner, because he's like, how can somebody, like, you know, it's not Bono coming to town, <laughs> um, that something fills up so quickly. So I refer to Michael as the Bono of the evaluation world. <laughs> so I've got the pleasure right now of, of introducing the Bono of the evaluation world. And um, some of you may know that Michael is an independent um, development and Program Evaluation Consultant, and he's the former president of the American Evaluation Association. After receiving his doctorate in sociology, he spent 18 years on the faculty at the University of Minnesota. He's written five books that I know of, probably more, um, and probably writing a few more now too. One of the books that really stands out that um, I think has been a real catalyst that's transformed how we position evaluation was the utilization-focused evaluation book that really um, advocated that um, we really look at designing evaluation to be more purposeful and useful, not that it's just an exercise in creating long reports that collect dust, that no one reads, that has no practical change value. And that book has really revolutionized how we look at evaluation. And since then, he's looked at taking it a step further, always one to push the envelope, and is now looking, I wrote a book about developmental evaluation. And really a whole new, it's a niche right now that's been long in coming. And it's really, uh, I think, been a catalyst in opening up how we position evaluation, not just within the world of evaluation, but evaluation in other sectors, within leadership, within change management, as a social innovator, as a catalyst of change. So for something that most people, um, he started doing work in evaluation, I think in the 1970s, early 70s, when it wasn't real, it was a new development in the nonprofit sector and a lot of sectors. Evaluation was just a new development. And as you know, it's not always the most welcome development. It's not the most loved thing that people jump up with their hands and say, oh, the evaluator's here, the evaluator's here. That's not how we see it. But I think that's Michael's quest, is that, you know, that we become uh, rock stars. So anyways, he's a rock star. Anyways. So um, 
I've, we've come to know him that he's extremely, obviously, courageous. He's very generous with his time and his energy and his knowledge. And, um, and you'll learn about uh, evaluation being adaptive. And I think he's one of the most adaptive people I know. For example, last week he was in Paris working with world leaders from different countries all over the world on the Paris Accord. And then he flew back to a small farm in northern Minnesota and did his farming and building. And then he got on a plane and came to Vancouver and worked with a small group of us and is here with us tonight. So I'd really like to welcome Michael. And I'll turn over the mic to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Marka. And uh, all the sponsors, I'm delighted to be here with you this evening and uh, quite in awe of this interest in uh, developmental evaluation. Um, one of the aspects of this is emphasizing uh, real-time feedback, being uh, uh, in touch with what's going on. So let's find out who is here. Um, how many of you consider yourselves evaluators and are willing to admit it? <laughs> All right, hold your hands high now so folks can look around. There's a brave group. Uh, how many of you are from the, the nonprofit voluntary sector doing program work? Some of these categories may overlap, all right. Um, government folks at any levels? Excellent. University folks? All right, good. Private sector people? Good, glad to have the private sector represented. That's not always the case. Um, how many of you are from Vancouver? How many from uh, British Columbia outside Vancouver? And outside British Columbia, but in Canada? And international? Hey, in the back. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, by way of helping people find additional resources, and I don't want modesty here, I know a good many of you, how many of you consider that you at least have a, a reasonable acquaintance with developmental evaluation? Good. So look around. Keep your hands out. Those of you to whom this is new and end up at the end of the evening more confused than when you came in, talk to these people. <laughs> I'm going to uh, talk for about uh, 45 minutes or so uh, to lay out the overview of this and then we'll engage in some Q&A together uh, and uh, take a break. And the second part of the evening, we're going to have three examples of developmental evaluation work being done here in health authorities in British Columbia, uh, folks that I had to, the chance to work with today to give you quite diverse examples of the way in which this can operate. And then we'll get a chance to further interact both around those examples and whatever else um, remains on your mind uh, as that gets finished. I'm going to, to begin by um, positioning myself uh, a bit, uh, let you know uh, more about my own journey to this place. Marika gave you some of the, the highlights of that. But I trace this perspective back to my innocent youth when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Burkina Faso uh, in the 1960s doing agricultural extension and community development among the Gorma people in eastern Burkina Faso when it was still Upper Volta, actually La Haute Volta, former French colony, um, working with the, the Gorma people. Gorma, about a half a million people uh, that span the Niger-Burkina uh, border. Uh, Gorma is what the French called them. In the Gourmanche language, Gorma means human being. And uh, so they self-designated themselves as uh, the Gorma. What they called me was Bon Pieno, which translates as white thing. <laughs> um, and in most of the villages I worked in, I was the first Bon Pieno that they had in, encountered. Um, and they, it was a transformative experience that had to be very adaptive and developmental because we actually went to Peace Corps, which has changed significantly, at a time when we had to figure out what we were going to do there. Uh, we basically worked with villagers to come up with things that, that 
22-year-old recent college graduates could do, and that wasn't a long list. Um, so uh, we, uh, we developed uh, projects, developed relationships with people, and were, in most cases, changed more than the changes we left behind. But it began to put me on a path of understanding what one faces in trying to figure out situations and, and um, develop relationships and co-create things that make sense to the, the, the people involved. I had the opportunity many years later to help launch the African Evaluation Association in Nairobi in 1999, and I was hoping that there might be representatives from Burkina there. The Gorma are not the majority group in, in Burkina, the Mosi are, but indeed there were three representatives from Burkina, uh, one of whom was actually Gorma. And uh, I sought him out. We had uh, lunch at the United Nations compound where we were meeting, and, and I caught up on the news from Fadn and Gorma, the land of the Gorma. Um, the, a lot of things had changed. The road between Ouagadougou and Niamey had been paved. Uh, all the international agencies were now there. None of them were working there at the time that I was there. There had been some, some important changes in government. Uh, climate change was hitting Burkina Faso in a big way. And as we caught up in things, I um, uh, reminded him uh, that when I was there, I had been called Bon Piano, and imagining that perhaps a certain, shall we say, political correctness might have even reached uh, the uh, uh, inner sanctum of West Africa here, where Burkina is, I reminded him of that and, and said, if I went back today, would I still be called Bon Piano? And he said, no, 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 we wouldn't call you Bon Piano now. I said, so what would I be called? And he said, Wampiano. I'd been away from the language a long time. Uh, he said, Wampiano? He said, yeah, old white thing. <laughs> uh, which is how I come to you uh, today um, <laughs> with the miles that that suggests and the inevitable limitations that that suggests. Um, but I tell that story in part as part of the preface to this inquiry uh, into developmental evaluation because a part of, of this engagement is a recognition that when we go to evaluate something, whatever the nature of the innovation, a project, a program, a policy, uh, a product, uh, an innovation, that the history of where that comes from matters, that the language about it matters, that the context within which it has developed matters, um, and that the identity that people have with regards to it matters. That's why I was partly asking you one aspect of what your identities are that you bring uh, to this. And these issues come to the fore in developmental evaluation because it is a part of understanding uh, innovations and interventions within a context, a developmental context. They don't suddenly just plop down from nowhere. These things come from someplace, and that matters, and they come from people, and the people matter, and their commitments and visions matter. And a lot of what's happened in evaluation has abstracted all that out and treats projects as these closed systems that get plopped down from nowhere that have boundaries around them and the context and the history and the people get abstracted out. Developmental evaluation puts them back in front and center. And we'll look at the consequences of that. And as we work together, I had the opportunity to work with a, a group of people in various health authority activities and innovations today. And these were recurrent themes as we worked together um, uh, about the identities of both the people providing services and the people receiving services and, and their history and their relationships and, and who they are and how they engage uh, with each other and where they've come from and where they're going. Um, so this notion of a journey and of context and understanding things as they unfold is the overarching storyline for this. Now, Marika noted that, that evaluation is not always well received. Um, and so for those of you who aren't evaluators, uh, and indeed for my colleagues here who are, uh, part of what we need to do is establish developmental evaluation within the larger context of evaluation. 
So I'm going to paint part of that context, and that will help you understand what the developmental evaluation niche is and um, help you decide what that niche means, because it's a niche within the larger field of evaluation. Uh, evaluation is a many splendored thing. There are lots of different approaches uh, and types of evaluation. In my utilization focused evaluation book, I list over 150 different types of evaluation, um, which is true of any field. There are different kinds of computers. So if you go to buy a computer, the, the people who are selling you the computer are going to ask you what kind you want, what characteristics, what do you need it to do. Uh, if you go to buy a car, you're going to have to decide on a, a type. What are, what are the things that you care about the car? How important is safety, uh, uh, gas mileage, uh, size? What are you going to be doing with it? And so those same questions come up. So I get telephone calls from people. Uh, and I'll answer the phone and uh, say, this is Michael Patton. And they say, are you the guy that does evaluation? And I say, well, that is the rumor. Uh, how can I help you? And they say, uh, we need one. <laughs> I, OK, um, what kind do you need? Kind? Um, well, you know, we've got this grant that we got. It's a three-year grant. And we're near the end of it, and we just notice that we're required to do an evaluation. <laughs> and I say, uh, I don't do that kind. Um, <laughs> and so a, a lot of this is going to be about the distinctions that have emerged and research that we've done around how people respond to evaluation. Indeed, one of the issues we talked about today was was. Uh, alternative words to use because evaluation is one of those words like biopsy and subpoena um, <laughs> that a lot of folks would just as soon not have in their lives. Uh, a colleague in Australia did a, some research on images of evaluation. She showed um, people uh, a number of different photographs uh, of things and asked them which one they most associated with evaluation. This was the winner. In second place was kangaroo roadkill. Um, and the people who most have this image of evaluation tend to be social innovators, people who are trying to bring about major change in society and their ex experience of evaluation is as heavy baggage, slows them down, weighs them down, interferes with the innovative process. They've got things to do, important stuff that needs to get changed, and evaluation becomes an obstacle uh, to that. That's part of the context then for uh, out of the utilization focused work that I did uh, and have done was trying to figure out ways to work with evaluation and with social innovators and people bringing about major change that didn't make evaluation an obstacle and something that slowed things down and interfered, but actually supported and nurtured the innovative process and indeed improved its likelihood of success. So to further encapsulate this tradition, let me take you back to the beginning. Um, every cultural group in the world has a creation story. It's one of the the, the few universals uh, around culture. And, and I treat evaluation as a culture. We have our language, we have our values, we have our ways of, of doing things. And for many people, as evaluation gets imposed upon them, it is a cross-cultural experience of the not altogether happy kind. Um, and so part of this is bridging the different language, the different perspectives, the different values, the different ways of, of experiencing the world, different paradigms about how the world operates. And as a culture, evaluation uh, has its own creation story to explain where we came from um, and the kind of issues that we face. So I want to be sure that um, those of you who haven't been initiated into evaluation culture know our Genesis story, which goes like this. In the beginning. That's how you know it's a Genesis story. Are you with me so far here? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. 
and God saw everything that was made. Behold, God said, it is very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And on the seventh day, God rested from all work. God's archangel came then asking, God, how do you know that what you created is very good? (laughs) What are your criteria? On what data do you base that judgment? Just what outcomes were you hoping to achieve? And aren't you a little close to the situation to make a fair and unbiased judgment? (laughs) God thought about these questions all that day, and God's rest was greatly disturbed. On the eighth day, God said, Lucifer, go to hell. Thus was evaluation born in a blaze of glory, so to speak. (laughs) And in the minds of many people, we continue to be associated with the dark side. Um, By way of full disclosure for any students in the audience who are wondering about a career choice, um, we invite you to the dark side um, to shed light on uh, other things that are, are going on. So it's, it's in, in this kind of, of context that uh, we begin to deal with some of the ways that people have experienced evaluation and some of the ways that, that they think about it. When I work with a new group, I begin typically with a, a workshop with, with staff and board members and funders, um, sometimes a half day, sometimes a, a full day to begin to design the evaluation, uh, set the stage for use, get people to share their past experiences. And when I'm doing that with an organization, um, I typically get introduced uh, not in the room. And then I come in wearing this. I have a large robe, black robe that goes with this that I don't uh, have with me tonight. There we got. So I come in with this robe and the mask and get up before the group and say, I'm the evaluator. (laughs) I'm the evaluator. The marvelous thing I found over the years is that people are absolutely not surprised. One time, I thought I'd been introduced, and the host was still doing the washroom uh, introductions, and, and uh, I walked in the back of the room, and somebody near the back turned around and saw me and said, evaluator's here. <laughs> and so it gives us an opportunity to talk about the images that people have and uh, what connections they make with this and and the potential uses of it. Uh, I had the opportunity a few years ago to uh, work with the Maori people in New Zealand as a part of a major national initiative that was being undertaken there. And there was a lot of resistance to the evaluation components of that. And uh, my New Zealand colleagues invited me over to help them strategize about how to engage with the Maori people in a way that that would make sense um, culturally to talk about this and and to deal with it. Um, And so I began reading about Maori culture and and, uh, their background and their language um, and their creation story. So when I arrived and had an opportunity to begin working with them, I began by telling them how taken I was with their creation story. I've become a collector as I travel around the world of Genesis stories. And the most common form of Genesis story is not unlike the one that I opened with, the the Western version that has a god or gods who create the world step back and say, wow, isn't that great? I did a great job. Um, The Maori story is quite different. And it's actually the story that I end the developmental evaluation book with. 
So for those of you who have the affliction of getting a book and going to the ending to see how it turns out, <laughs> this is how the developmental evaluation uh, turns out. In the Maori creation story, in the beginning, Father Sky and Mother Earth were joined in a fierce embrace. Such a fierce embrace that their children were born into darkness in this tight space. And over the eons, they began, the children, to conceive of ways of pushing their parents apart to get more space. And they squabbled about whether this was a good idea. Some of them tried it on their own, and it became clear that to be successful, they would have to join forces, and they would need the strength of Tane, the oldest and strongest of the siblings. And they nagged at him and nagged at him and eventually convinced him. And so Tane, who had observed their failed efforts, told them that they would have to all put their shoulders on Father Sky and their legs against Mother Earth and push together, which they did and separated Father Sky, whose name was Range, and Mother Earth, whose name was Papa. And the light rushed in, and the first thing that Tane saw were the tears from Father Sky at the separation from his beloved. And that became the rain in Maori culture. And then he saw that in separating Father Sky and Mother Earth, he had exposed the nakedness of Mother Earth, and he was embarrassed and ashamed and began to conceive of planting trees to cover up his nakedness. But he had never planted a tree before, and so the first time he planted one, he put the leaves in the earth and the roots in the air, and the tree shriveled up and died. So he tried again. This time he laid the tree flat on the earth, and again it shriveled up and died. And the third time he put the roots in the earth and the leaves in the air, and birds came, and animals appeared, and a forest grew, and Tani said, that's what I want to do. And he proceeded around the world planting trees and became the god of the forest and of all living things in Maori culture. So when I went to work with the Maori and told them how taken I was with their creation story, because as near as I could tell, they were the first developmental evaluators. That's a story of wanting to change the way things were, but not quite sure exactly what that would look like, trying things out, knowing when it doesn't work, trying something else out, and then as that thing emerged, that it hoped for, seeing that there were ripple effects, that an entire system emerged and was changed as a result of that initial um, intervention. So that's the kind of thing that, that we're looking at, is those situations where people are trying to bring about change but aren't exactly sure what that will look like and understand that as change occurs, it will intersect with other things in a set of system interconnections that are not predictable or even knowable in advance. And what makes that challenging for evaluators is that there's nothing more established in evaluation than in order to evaluate something, you have to know in advance what the outcomes are going to be and have clear, specific, and measurable goals to evaluate against. So if you don't have those, what do you do? That's the challenge that gave rise to developmental evaluation. As a part of this, the evaluators will recognize these as the original distinctions in the field. Formative and summative evaluation are the magic Dakota ring words that prove that you've been to evaluation training at some point in your life. And when we do introductory evaluation training, we have people practice saying the words formative and summative so that they roll off your tongue as if you've been saying them uh, since you uh, were a toddler. These are the original distinctions. I talk about types and purposes of evaluation. Michael Scriven, an Australian philosopher evaluator, created these distinctions with regard to curriculum evaluation in the 1960 in a classic article in which he was reacting to the fact that people were rushing to summative evaluation, which is deciding if something works when you answer the question, does it work, is it effective, 
Uh, should we uh, expand it? Should we take it to scale? Should we disseminate it? Should we replicate it? Those are summative questions. They sum up. They are summit decisions. That evaluation was quickly being asked to take on those questions without first going through a period of being sure that the project, program, product, innovation was ready for summative evaluation. And the period and process of getting ready, he called formative evaluation, which is forming the project or program so that it has a clear theory of change, it has a logic model, it has clear, specific, and measurable outcomes that are connected to the activities that are going to go on, then when you've got that, you've kind of worked out the bugs, you've had some implementation time to figure out how to make this thing actually doable, then it's ready for summative evaluation. And formative and summative evaluation from the beginning were joined hand in glove. They remain the primary distinctions in the field. For years, I ran a research and evaluation center at the University of Minnesota, and virtually all of our contracts were for uh, formative and summative evaluation. Three-year contracts, a year and a half of formative, followed by a year and a half of summative. Five-year contracts, two and a half a year formative, followed by two and a half years of, of summative. Um, and so it was in that context that I was doing an evaluation in northern Minnesota of a program from the Blandon Foundation called the Blandon Community Leadership Program that took people from small rural communities and Native American reservations um, and took them through an intensive seven-day residential experience where they learned to do strategic planning for their communities. They learned things around community engagement, uh, communications, how to deal with community indicators, um, they got their Myers-Briggs scores so they knew who they were. Uh, <laughs> they uh, worked together on, on small group dynamics. And this was a hugely transformative experience for these rural folks, most of whom had never gone through anything approaching such intensive professional uh, development. Uh, and I had a contract to do two and a half years of formative evaluation followed by two and a half years of summative because there was a lot of national interest in this leadership model and um, uh, in what its impacts were uh, uh, both the community level and at the individual leader level. And it was a great group of folks to work with, the program director, the major staff, the funders, the people in the foundation, the president in the foundation, some university faculty who were on their advisory group were the steering committee that I worked with. I met with them quarterly gave them feedback about the formative findings. We were following up to see what kind of projects people were doing, what they were using from what they learned, getting feedback about the, the retreats themselves, uh, interviewing key informants about how they viewed them when they came back, uh, examining through case studies the work that they did. And they used that information uh, and changed and adapted the program based upon that feedback. And on a cold February morning, it was actually a blizzard and about this time of year in northern Minnesota, after two and a half years of formative evaluation, I met with the steering committee to make the transition to summative evaluation. And I began by expressing my appreciation for such a, a wonderful experience of working with people who are hungry for information. They weren't resistant. Um, they wanted to improve the program, they enjoyed improving the program, they weren't uh, uh, defensive about the weaknesses that we turned up. Uh, and then I said, and now we're moving into two and a half years of summative evaluation and you can't make any more changes to the program. Because when you go to answer the summative question, does it work, you have to have a stable, fixed it. It's called the it issue in evaluation, in our technical jargon. Um, the it question is what is the it that works or doesn't work? And if people keep changing the it all the time, you can't make a summative judgment. So I said from now on for the next two and a half years, you're gonna implement this program the way it's currently uh, designed 
based upon the formative feedback, keep it standardized. Everybody will go through the same set of experiences, and then we'll see what the overall effects are. And the program director, who I'd gotten to know fairly well, looked at me with unusual hostility and said, but we've learned we can't stop changing the program. And I explained again formative and summative and why summative needed to be a fixed intervention so that we'd know what the it was. And he said, no, you're not understanding. What we've learned is we have to keep changing the program because the world around us is changing. We can't have a fixed curriculum because Minnesota's caught in a boom and bust cycle and in agriculture and immigrants are moving from the Twin Cities out into rural areas and changing the demography. Um, and every time there's an election, there's new policies and procedures put into place and we have to update the curriculum to deal with change policies at the state level, at the county level, at the federal uh, level. And technology is changing. I was doing this work before there were cell phones and before there was the internet, but there were hints of this stuff that was going to come. And, and already people were beginning to get a sense that rural communities would be deeply affected by changed communications um, and that they would have to be updating things, uh, that the stuff that was going on with young people was changing, the music was changing, their communications with each other was changing. They were trying to keep young people in their rural communities. Uh, everything around them, the demography, the politics, the economy, the society, was changing. And they said, how in the world, in the face of all that, that's what we've been learning and hearing from people, could we have a fixed curriculum? And then he looked at me with even greater hostility and said, formative evaluation, summative evaluation, is that all you people have? And as my evaluation colleagues here know, that pretty much is what we had. Those were the biggies. That, those were the distinctions we made. And I felt quite defensive, and I said, well, you know, we could if you wanted to. I mean, we'd have to change the contract, and the board would have to approve it and really think through what this is about. But, you know, we could if you wanted to. Now, we shouldn't make a sudden decision here, but we, we could engage in developmental evaluation <laughs> and he said what's that I said that's where you keep developing <laughs> and he said that's what we want to do why didn't you mention that earlier uh, and that's the true story of um, uh, how this emerged so I'm a uh, greatly sympathetic to social innovators who find things emerging uh, out of engagement because this e emerged in response to a client who needed something different than what I had to offer at that time. And so it was an adaptation of my own practice to their expressed needs and their understandings and they got there before I did that in complex dynamic systems where things are changing, fixed interventions don't work very well. And yet, and you all know this from your own experience, our world remains in the grasp of the idea that there must be a best practice model for anything and everything, and if we just find it, we can spread it around the world and everything will be okay. The silver bullet the fixed model, the thing that gets replicated over and over again. And that's part of the large-scale issue that we face in the, the bigger picture of how does change occur and what are we trying to create. Uh, because evaluation remains to this day dominated by a fixed model mentality that our job is to determine if a fixed static intervention of some kind ought to be taken to scale. The methods are geared toward that. The concepts are geared toward that. And that's why I treat developmental evaluation as a relatively small and narrow niche for people who understand what they're trying to do is to adapt to complex dynamic systems that are ever-changing and that they're never going to get a fixed model. 
that standardized and replicated in the same way over and over again. And that there are ways for evaluative thinking to contribute in innovative situations where people aren't quite sure where they're going and don't know what the outcomes are in advance, but will know them when they see them. That way of engaging in the world largely gets made fun of. But for people who are out on the cutting edge, experimenting with new ways of doing things, that's how the world actually works. I didn't set out to create developmental evaluation. It emerged out of interactions with people in the real world who were trying to figure out how to create a program that was responsive to changing conditions and changing clientele. And the tools I had didn't fit what they needed. So we created it together. Developmental evaluation then informs and supports innovative and adaptive development in complex dynamic environments. Developmental evaluation brings to innovation and adaptation the processes of asking evaluative questions, applying evaluation logic, and gathering and reporting evaluative data to support project, program, product, and or organizational development with timely feedback. The core question that we kept working with today in the, in the BC groups here was what's getting developed? And to be able to track development, monitor development, give feedback about development, look for forks in the road as things get developed. How did you reach a point where you decided to go one direction versus another? And to help people become more intentional and conscious about taking those forks in the road. Because part of what happens with social innovators who are deeply involved in bringing about change is that they're often involved in making such rapid adaptations that they're not very good at documenting either what those changes are or why they made those adaptations. And so that history gets lost. Those developmental moments get blurred over time. Things that they're sure they would never forget are gone a week later. I appreciate that more and more in my Wampiano stage of life. <laughs> um, and so the importance of documenting things in real time, the rationale, why we go one direction or another, what have we noticed happening that leads us to adapt um, what we're doing to new conditions, that's the work of the developmental evaluator. It separates improvement from development. Formative evaluation is about improving a model to get it ready for a summative test. Development is about changing and adapting the model to different conditions. And that may well mean that under the prior conditions, it was quite effective. It doesn't mean it was weak. It means that the world has changed, and therefore you have to change what you're doing to keep up with it. That's part of the developmental journey. One of the metaphors that we commonly use to just make the distinctions between formative and summative that comes from one of our uh, pioneer figures, Bob Stake at the University of Illinois, is he said that when the cook tastes the soup, it's formative evaluation. When the guests taste the soup, it's summative evaluation. And what then is developmental evaluation? It's when the guests and the cook go together to the market and see what vegetables are in season, what fresh fish are there, and talk about what kind of meal do we want to have, what do we want to prepare together, what's the occasion, who's coming, and design a meal to fit that circumstance. And create it, and develop it in a context. Not then to publish that recipe for all time, but to be sure that what they did fit that occasion and the people who came, who are a part of the development itself. So the conditions that challenge traditional model testing evaluation are a high degree of innovation and change, ongoing development, high degrees of uncertainty about exactly what we're doing and where we're going, dynamic and rapidly changing situations, emergent situations where things are unfolding, and overall systems change. A number of you are involved in systems change. One of the changes that has happened 
in the last decade is the unit of analysis for change and for evaluation has changed. We say that evaluation grew up in the projects. Evaluation has a project mentality. Projects are, tend to be closed systems. And one of the things that's happened in the last 40 years is an increased recognition that projects themselves seldom bring about lasting change. Lasting change comes from changing the systems of which projects are a part. And so foundations, governments, people involved in, in bringing about change are looking at changing systems, which is a different unit of analysis than is a self-contained, closed system kind of project or program. One of the common findings of ineffective projects and programs in 40 years of evaluation results is that programs tend to be ineffective because they're in dysfunctional systems. And the project or program by itself can't make the needed changes in a system that interferes with the outcomes they're trying to achieve. And to get those lasting outcomes that they aspire to, the system in which the project or program is embedded needs to change. So the unit of analysis has changed. And the techniques that work for evaluating projects and programs don't work for systems change. Because systems are open. They're dynamic. They have multiple factors going on at once. You can't control them. They require different kinds of, of methods. And so adaptive management approaches on the management side is parallel to developmental evaluation approaches on the evaluation side. Let me share with you the work of Henry Mintzberg that many of you, I suspect most of you know, one of the great organizational development management scholars in Canada at McGill University. Um, Henry writes about strategy, he comes out with a new book on strategy almost every year. The Wall Street Journal uh, a couple years ago named Henry Mintzberg one of the 10 most influential management scholars of the last 50 years. Um, Henry works primarily in the private sector with businesses, although he works with some voluntary sector and, and government organizations. And in 2007, he came out with a book called Tracking Strategies. And I, um, through my uh, work with Francis Wesley, who was at McGill and, and uh, Henry was, was her mentor, um, met Henry and um, I uh, congratulated Henry on writing an evaluation book. And he said, a what? <laughs> I said, tracking strategies. Doesn't that just scream to you of evaluation? He said, what's evaluation? And thus began a dialogue. Um, but in fact, without calling it that, Henry was tracking the ways in which high-performing organizations changed over time and what made them high-performing. And the book is something like 16 case studies of long-term organizational clients that Henry knew well and their stories of strategic implementation. And what he found and I'm going to simplify it here a bit um, because he deals a great deal with complexity, has profound implications for this work. Henry notes that organizations begin with some kind of strategic thinking uh, or planning process where they identify an attended strategy. Now you can apply the language of evaluation to this in the same way. So we can say a program begins with intended outcomes. An organization begins with an intended strategy of some kind. And then they begin to implement that, what he calls deliberate strategy, or what we would call in evaluation the implemented outcomes, those things that you intend to do that you actually do, the strategy that you intend to implement that you actually deliberately carry out. But here's where it gets interesting. Henry found that no high-performing organization ever implements all of what it intends to do. As it actually begins the implementation process and sees how that's playing out and unfolding, some things get left behind. Things that were bad ideas, things that aren't going to work, uh, things that, that get supplanted because other priorities take over, 
And as the strategy unfolds or as the outcomes and programs get implemented, some gets done, some gets left behind, and some new opportunities arise. And so in the midst of implementation, there are also emergent strategies, opportunities that weren't even realized at the time of the strategic planning process, opportunities that weren't part of the original logic model because nobody knew to include them emergent outcomes, things that unfold. And that when you look over a five-year period at where an organization or a program ends up, it is a combination of what was originally intended that actually got done, what got left behind, and what got picked up. It's that combination that tells you where you are. This is the developmental evaluation roadmap. This is the journey. And what it runs up against is the dominant motif in evaluation is the accountability paradigm that says you ought to end up five years later exactly where you thought you were going to go five years earlier. That we're supposed to be so prescient when we write funding proposals that we know exactly how the world's going to unfold for the next five years and we're going to end up exactly where we said we were, attaining those specified predetermined goals, and to not arrive there is failure. And Henry's work says no high-performing organization operates that way. Failure is not to leave some things behind that aren't working and not to pick up some new opportunities along the way that you didn't even know earlier and to to combine those together in a new mix that you couldn't even have imagined when you were doing the strategic planning. And yet most accountability reporting, and we looked at some of these today here in BC, are formatted to say, what did you intend to do? What of that did you accomplish? And what didn't you accomplish? And what were your reasons for not doing so? And the clear implication is something went wrong. Either it was a bad idea or bad implementation. So this becomes a powerful framework to recognize, and, and some organizations here in Canada, the International Development Research Center, for example, in Ottawa, that does work around the world on behalf of Canadians in development, they've adopted this framework as their evaluation reporting framework. And when they do a five-year plan in each of their program areas, what they expect to report against is what did you intend, what were you able to do of what you intended? What did you leave behind and why? What did you pick up? And how did that combination bring you to where you are now? What have you learned along the way? How do you make sense of that for the future? That, in a nutshell, is what developmental evaluators do. As we do so, we're dealing in both the planning side and the evaluation side with some common wisdom about uncertainty and emergence. Um, I suspect uh, many of you have your own favorite quote in this regard. I like this one just so I can say a Field Marshal Helmut Carl Bernard von Mulkey, um, <laughs> who uh, in World War II said, no battle plan ever survives contact with the enemy. Um, or if you prefer your wisdom from the streets, heavyweight champion Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until he gets hit. Um, well, that's what the Mintzberg story is. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't plan, just don't take your plans too seriously. Don't confuse your plan with reality. Don't force your plan upon the world, because the world will go on with or without your plan. Or what Tom Peter said in his liberation management book, Ready, Fire, Aim which means you learn from engagement and realize what you were heading for after you've fired. It means dealing with the unexpected and the unpredicted and taking unintended consequences seriously. One of the dirty little secrets in evaluation is that despite a lot of lip service to unintended consequences, most evaluations never look for them, never spend any time on them. They're a little box somewhere up in a logic model the only way you can find unintended consequences is to go out and do open-ended field work and find out what really happened. 
And most evaluation budgets are entirely committed to predetermined performance measures, and there's no field work capability to go out and find out what emerged, what was unintended, what really happened. We've got these narrow blinders on around that accountability model. The evidence-based practices is a, a part of that. The search for best practices and the battle then uh, about how the world has changed between the dissemination of proven models versus a more bottoms-up adaptive management process as things unfold. So the, a part of this is differentiating models from principles. In developmental evaluation, and we were doing this today, we identify principles of change, but those principles have to be adapted to different contexts instead of setting down a prescribed model that you do the same thing over and over again. And, and that doesn't mean that there's not a place for models. I, I want to be careful in um, my fervor for developmental evaluation that I don't overreach and give you the impression that I think this is the only thing that everybody ought to be doing. We don't want people out experimenting with doses of polio vaccine and saying, well, let's try doubling the dose today and see what happens with that. There are things that are known. There are things that are knowledge-based that, that we've learned that we ought to be implemented that way. But it turns out that a polio vaccination campaign cannot be standardized. It has to be adapted to the local population. In the context, the great surgeon Atul Gawande, who wrote the book Complications about the ways in which accidents happen in hospital settings, and is a New Yorker journalist, went along on a polio vaccination uh, campaign that the World Health Organization was doing in India after a recent outbreak in polio, and they take epidemiologists along, and they have, the World Health Organization has a formulaic best practices, highly regimented campaign for when there's an outbreak of polio. It's part of the worldwide effort to eradicate polio. They don't make this up every time. They know how to, they revaccinate within 150 square kilometers. They know how many Land Rovers, how many vaccinators, how many, much vaccine they're going to need for a certain population. It's highly formulaic. And they take epidemiologists along to figure out how did we miss these kids who got polio in our last vaccination. And when he went along, they found that at the time of the most recent vaccination in that area of India, there was a rumor going along around in the Muslim community that the polio vaccine was a Hindu plot to sterilize Muslim children. And so a group of mothers hid their children. And so they had to adapt the campaign to deal with that religious and political conflict. There are other parts of Africa where people have other impressions of vaccinations. And you have to understand that and develop the campaign. But that doesn't mean that you're screwing around with the vaccination. Although in Ethiopia and Somalia, they're learning that starving children, the vaccination doesn't work very well for. I'm going to skip a couple of these in the interest of time and turn to one final piece here. Um, the complexity part of this and give you a couple of examples and then we'll open it up for uh, some interaction before we take the break and then turn to the, the BC examples. And I, I just want to illustrate uh, with a couple of complexity concepts the way in which complexity understandings affect our engagement with developmental evaluation. One of the core complexity concepts is the idea of emergence. That in interventions of any kind, in social innovation and in change, people come together, things happen that are not predictable, people find each other uh, in ways that, that are not exactly uh, anticipatable, that have an impact upon what gets done, what outcomes are achieved. One of my favorite examples of this is a program that I did some years ago um, an innovative effort to have university administrators, deans, department heads, vice presidents, presidents uh, in the southwestern part of the United States engage with more experiential learning and look at what it would mean to introduce a greater degree of, of experiential 
learning in the university curriculum. And their process for doing this was to take them on wilderness trips, um, people who weren't hikers and kayakers, and have them engage in learning by doing, reflect upon the learning experience, and think about its implications for how students in their universities learn. So they got funded for this in a, a fund called the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education and Innovation in the US Department of Education. And the, the, it was a year-long process um, where they did 10 days of, of hiking in the Gila wilderness of New Mexico in the fall, 10 days of rock climbing in the Arizona mountains in the winter, 10 days of river rafting and kayaking on the San Juan River in Utah in the spring, and 10 days hiking the Grand Canyon in the summer. And the people implementing the program had come across uh, some writings I had done, and they had a mandated evaluation they had to do. And they called me up and um, said, you know, we need somebody to do this evaluation. Could you design a survey to follow up people and find out what happened to them? And they told me about the program, and I said, you know, my approach to evaluation is to match the method to the nature of the intervention. And if ever an intervention called out for participant observation. I mean, doesn't this just speak to you of um, the evaluator needs to go on these trips? Um, uh, a survey isn't just going to quite cut it. And so um, they were good with that. Um, so I went on these trips, and uh, it was uh, transformative, and I'm still hiking to this day, and I wrote a book about the Grand Canyon, none of which was in my life plan before I did this evaluation. Uh, but the very first day, 20 people didn't know each other from different colleges around the Southwest assembled at the trailhead in the Gila wilderness, carrying 40-pound packs about the head uphill on about a 15-kilometer hike. And within an hour, two groups had formed, groups that endured not only throughout the 10 days in the Gila wilderness, but throughout the entire year. And had I done a survey of these people and not known about these two groups, I would have missed one of the most important aspects of what had an impact on people. One group called themselves the truckers, and the other group called themselves the turtles. <laughs> and these were self-designated names, and they found each other. The people that like to hike fast, the people who are goal-directed, the people who said, Point us where we're going, how far is it, let's get there. And the other folks who get up in the morning, barely, um, <laughs> get going with the day, meander along the trail, have lots of conversations, take lots of pictures, stop and smell the cacti and barely get into camp at night. The truckers and the turtles had different experiences. And there were some people who tried to go both ways, but it turned out most folks were either a trucker or a turtle. I was the only one who was a genuine buy. <laughs> and that was because it was part of my job description to be in and get to know both groups. Now, most evaluation gathers data on individual participants in programs. We may do pre and post data, case studies, but the basic unit of analysis for most evaluation is individuals. And yet everything we know about ourselves as human beings is that we don't go through programs as individuals, we go through programs in groups. Groups that emerge in the experience itself. People find each other. I've been doing this for 40 years, and when we interview people in open-ended interviews and ask them, what was the most important factors in your experience of the program, they regularly reply, the people I met in the program. The relationships I formed the people I got to know. That's emergence. We can't know what those groups are going to be, but people find each other. They self-organize, and that affects their experience. And if we don't know what those groups are and take that into account, we're missing a major aspect of how change occurs at every level, in programs, in communities, and that requires so open-ended fieldwork. Let me take just one more example of a complexity concept. We may pick up some others later in the evening. The notion of nonlinearity. Program logic models, most of the constructs for evaluation, assume 
the linear cause and effect. One thing leads to another. There's a direct relationship, Newtonian. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So a certain amount of inputs will lead to a certain amount of activities, which leads to a certain amount of outputs, which leads to a certain amount of outcomes. But in complex dynamic environments where things are unfolding, very small actions can ripple through a system and create very large reactions in the lives of vulnerable people and poor people and people going through programs. It's not this simple uh, linear progression uh, through things. I'm working with a group in Minnesota now uh, on an employment uh, training program. And one of the things that they regularly deal with is that um, a small, what would be for most of us, um, a relatively small but annoying hassle of having a car breakdown for a poor person um, that doesn't have backup, the car breaks down, they're not able to get to the program, they're then not able to get to their internship job, they get, uh, as a result, they get kicked out of the program because they're not attending, which means they lose their welfare subsidy to be in the program, which means they can't pay the rent, which means they end up being homeless. And when we've done homeless interviews, most of the people I've interviewed uh, who are recent homeless, as well as some that are longer term, trace it back to some small thing that in most of our lives we would have solved, but because they didn't have the capacity to solve it, it rippled and built on itself and spiraled, and they ended up on the streets because somebody got sick and they couldn't manage to get to the doctor. And they, or they spent their money on the doctor and in our U.S. health system and ended up not being able to do the rent or not fix the car. Or fix the car but couldn't pay for their meds and ended up having an event and ended up on the streets. Those kind of nonlinear effects happen at the individual level. They happen at the system level. When SARS hit Toronto a few years ago, a relatively small number of people in the grand scheme of things, something between 20 and 30 people, as I remember, died from SARS. But for 18 months, the economy of Toronto took a huge hit. The convention business basically shut down. That effects rippled through taxis, food services, restaurants, hotels, and all the businesses dependent upon that because conventions canceled. They didn't wait to figure out whether or not this was going to get to be a big deal. Last summer, when H1N1 hit different places in different ways, it hit Mexico City in a way that shut down Mexico City for the summer. Huge hit on the entire economy of Mexico City out of all proportion to the actual danger and, and effects of that disease. So this opens us up to be aware of these dynamics in innovations, in programs, where dynamic events are occurring that evaluation has typically not been prepared to deal with because we've con constructed models of programs that are highly linear, that are fixed, that are closed systems. And opening that up in complex dynamic environments takes us into this developmental space. Let me stop with that overview. You've been very uh, patient uh, with um, my examples and trying to, to uh, take you very quickly through both the history of evaluation and some of the implications of these ideas. We'll take a, a few minutes here for your questions. You need to go up to a microphone if you have a question or comment. Then we'll take a break and come back and uh, share with you some examples of developmental evaluation here in BC to ground this in a more concrete way and uh, get a chance to interact some more around that. So uh, who wants to be the first emergent questioner out of this group? Here we've got, please introduce yourself to the group and to me and... and uh, sure. Hi, my name is David Lee and Michael, thanks very much for your time today. My mind's just buzzing with all your ideas and I'd like to join the dark side as well. You're welcome, good. My question is around, you, you talked about this experience as an evaluator, you, you now have to 
where you now embed yourself within the programs or the people that you're working with, how does that impact your ability to remain an objective evaluator? You can't. The whole notion of objectivity is one of the challenges in this, this kind of, of work. Now, there's a bigger debate going on about whether uh, objectivity can be uh, done under any conditions. What can be done is independence. Um, one can be neutral. Objectivity, philosophically, is a tougher thing and a longer conversation. But your question's really important because you're right. The developmental evaluation role and part of the controversy about this, and, and it really is controversial, and part of it is embedded in the very question that you've, you've raised, is that developmental evaluation becomes part of the intervention. It's not separate from it. In, in traditional accountability-directed independent evaluation, which some people think can be objective, but let's just treat it for the moment independent, you're outside the system, you're gathering data about it, and that follows the premise of measurement 101 that the measurement of something should be separate and independent from the thing measured. In developmental evaluation, in a complex dynamic system, the measurement becomes part of the process. The very process of asking reflective questions, of making things explicit, of figuring out what the data is that informs a decision going one way or another is part of the innovative process. It can't be disentangled from it. And so the people who fund developmental evaluation have to understand they're not getting an independent accountability evaluation. That goes back to the types piece that I began with. Developmental evaluation serves a different purpose and, and serves a different function. Now, I've done some developmental evaluations where the process of innovation, the funders wanted to look at that combination of developmental evaluation and innovation and uh, hired an independent evaluator outside that process to examine how it unfolded. And then you can have an independent evaluator do what we now call meta-evaluation, which is evaluating that independent evaluation, all of which leads to the Evaluators Full Employment Act. Um, <laughs> so that we keep finding layers of work to look over the shoulder of the next person. Um, what I was actually doing in Paris last week was a meta-evaluation, an evaluation of evaluations that other folks had done around the, the Paris Declaration. So really important that developmental evaluation, indeed one of the main things that ran through our discussions today here in BC, and you'll see this in the examples that we're going to share after the break, is that the developmental evaluators are part of the action. And so when you tell the story, you're telling the story of how that reflective data collection uh, process was a part of the way the innovation unfolded. Um, and you're, you're, you're um, reporting that even as you report the, uh, the work. It means that the, the issues of the credibility of the evaluator, the training of the evaluator, uh, the funding of the evaluator, all those things play a different role in the developmental evaluation context than they do in the more traditional, independent, outside the action evaluation framework. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. This might seem a little off topic, but I think it really is right to the point and, and maybe relevant to the conversation that's going to happen after the break, and that is... For years, I've, well, I, I served in a role as the head of a research... And please introduce yourself. Sorry, Diane Feingood, and uh, I'm the incoming uh, president and CEO of the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. So my question is about the relationship between research and evaluation. And for years I've been asking this question because I served in a similar role at the national level for a number of years, and, and I was a basic scientist. But when I came into this domain, I thought... Well, what's the difference? These things are really about the same thing. And I've, got, I've asked this question to many different people and gotten fascinating answers like, well, research is what happens when you plan it ahead and evaluations is what happens when you come in afterwards and try to figure out what happened. And that came from a researcher, no surprise. Uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious to hear from uh, the Bono of evaluation. Um, 
what, what, is there really a difference between these two and, and, and why should there be a difference or, or not? The, great question. Thank you for it. It also came up today in, our, in our, our group and comes up regularly. The American Evaluation Association sponsors a, a listserv um, that now has about 6,000 participants. Um, and you can virtually turn the seasonal calendar by when enough new people have joined the listserv that this question comes up. Um, uh, oh, it must have been three months since, um, uh, because it's a regular question. And uh, as your question suggests, there's not a definitive answer. People disagree about it. So I will share with you my own perspective about it. Uh, and it's a perspective that I've written about in the Utilization Focused Evaluation book and in the Developmental Evaluation book. I think that they are, I think it's useful to make the distinction. You know, definitions are in, inherently um, arbitrary, and so we define things to make distinctions. I think it's useful to make the, the distinction, and the utility is driven by the following, um, that they are evaluated by different criteria. That the way I would evaluate research is different than the way I would evaluate an evaluation, and that, to me, makes them different. The, the profession of evaluation, Canadian Evaluation Society, um, the first professional evaluation society in the world, the American Association, the Australasian Association, the African Society, the European Society, and there are now 85 national evaluation societies around the world. One of the things that they do as professional societies is have adopted standards for what constitutes a good evaluation. Those standards call for evaluations to be judged by their utility, their feasibility, their propriety, and their accuracy. The part that most overlaps with research are the accuracy standards. They call for data to be credible, valid, reliable. Um, but the research in general, although there is applied research, research in general is not evaluated by its utility. It's evaluated by its contribution to knowledge, which is an end in and of itself. Evaluation that contributes to knowledge but doesn't improve programs or improve decision making about a program, no matter how elegant the design, no matter how rigorous the design, if the results get published in a peer-reviewed journal of the highest prestige and that evaluation is not used, it's a bad evaluation. That's the standard to which we are held as a profession. And that use is within some reasonable time frame. So that the, what utilization-focused evaluation is about is meeting the standard of intended use by intended users. And one of the intended uses, bringing us back to tonight, is development, is ongoing development. So that space and the people I work with, the intended users who are social innovators, our contract is to engage in evaluation in a way that is useful to the developmental process. That's the contribution. Now, there may be a larger contribution to knowledge, but that's secondary. The first priority is to inform action in real time. Different criteria, different fields. Does that make sense? We'll take two more and take the break. Uh, lady in the back, please introduce yourself, and then we'll take uh, the question up here. Uh, my name is Trina Isaacson, sometimes researcher, sometimes evaluator, and sometimes none of the above. Um, I'm curious about working with people for whom uh, formative and summative evaluation is just in their blood because of their history doing program evaluations or having to respond to government uh, contract requirements and who don't necessarily have an inherent culture of learning within their organization. How do you help nudge them in this direction? <laughs> Another great question, thank you. And, and I want to be very clear, although you will detect a slight fervor that I have for this work um, and can get evangelical about it, I'm quite serious that, that in no way would I expect or even want to supplant formative and summative um, or think that this is the only way to do evaluation. Um, models do need to be tested. Models are out there. People are supporting models. There's rigor in figuring out how to improve models and how to decide uh, whether they work or, or in what ways they work. That work is not going uh, to go away. But for folks that want to open the door, um, I really suggest starting small and um, not 
this is hard work. There's a lot to learn about it. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to fund. Um, uh, it's, if people have trouble maintaining the course uh, with it because the, uh, the accounting, accountability environment uh, comes down so hard, a lot of times people begin down this path and then they spend a few months on it and then they say, all right, let's move into what did we accomplish and did it work? Um, so it's to be done with some caution. That said, the place to look, it's a great question, the place to look is where people are serious about innovation, where they're wanting to be on the cutting edge, where they're willing to say, we're going to try out things and we don't know how it's going to turn out. Obviously, you can't run a government on that model. Um, but there are places in government, there are places in organizations where people are saying, we don't have solutions for this particular problem. There is a group in the Department of Education, the Ministry of Education in Ontario, that are tasked with doing innovation in education. There are people working in poverty in Canadian communities who are engaging the community in problem solving. They can't start out with predetermined goals if they're going to collaborate with the community to create stuff that is meaningful to the community. And so in a classic diffusion of innovations model, you're looking for early adopters. I really, despite what you're experiencing tonight, don't try to convert people to this. I lay it out there and have people find it. The folks in BC found me and said, we want to do this because we feel a need to do systems change within our health authorities. We've got some support for that, not for everything, but for some aspects of it. And we want to do that in a rigorous, thoughtful way that is developmental. Look for those folks. Look for the people who are serious about innovation, about trying out things and are willing to try that, and you'll find that formative and summative actually doesn't work in that space because you have to already have a model to do formative and summative. One of the purposes of developmental evaluation is to develop the model. Now, that may get to a stage where it can be passed into the formative summative track. That's one form of developmental evaluation. When we look at, at formative and summative, because the model has to already be there to be improved and then summative evaluated, one form of developmental is what I call preformative. Where do the models come from? They have to be generated, developed, created somewhere. In that space is a place where you can find folks that want to do this kind of work. Not the whole organization. Look for the cracks. Look for the openings where people want to try out new stuff. Final question here before the break. Thank you very much. Uh, Please introduce yourself, sir. I'm Shiraz. I'm working in SFU, Simon Fraser, and I've done a lot of evaluation in health and education in Africa as well. My question is, do you talk to people like World Health Organization and World Bank about the, the development and <laughs> evaluation? Because I find that when I was working in Africa, there was the whole question of involving the nationals and the nurses to evaluate the vaccination program. But they would always, the World Health Organization would challenge our results. And, and it was always difficult. And here in Canada, I find a lot of evaluation is done. And then the magazines like McLean's and so on, or the Fraser Institute comes out with a list of best schools based on, on purely wishy-washy interpretations. Thank you. Um, I, that, that question actually follows quite nicely from the previous one because I, I do work with places like the, the, the World Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Health Organization, uh, CETA, USA. They were at the, the meetings I was at last week. And uh, again, a part of what I'm finding is that the dominant paradigm in those organizations is a fairly traditional accountability-driven evaluation. But there are places and people working on issues where they're really uh, very much embracing this. So for example, in, in USAID, there's a group working on conflict resolution. You can't predetermine the outcomes of a conflict resolution process. 
it's a negotiated process. Part of what's going to emerge is how people engage with each other and what they decide to do. And so in, in the, the work around uh, conflict uh, work or the civil society work where they are trying to embed some civil society norms as a part of the development process that requires participation of people, the kind of work that you were talking about, on the ground, you can't go in and impose a set of outcomes on folks. The whole civil service, service, civil society development needs to be participatory, needs to be emergent, needs to engage people, has to build capacity. And so where people are doing that kind of work, developmental evaluation is a natural fit for them. And it, the most common reaction I get to the book and the work is, um, thank you for giving a name to the stuff we've been trying to do because we've been stumbling through that because the other stuff hasn't worked for us all the way along. So there, there are folks doing this in various ways in these kinds of, of places, folks working on human rights issues, um, working in climate change, which is a highly volatile um, area uh, with complex dynamic systems where things are, are changing rapidly and, and ecological change systems. They're gravitating towards this kind of work because they realize that, that they're in complex, dynamic, emergent kinds of phenomena and they need evaluation approaches that are consistent with that way of doing the work that still bring evaluative thinking to bear that help them be rigorous about the development process and track what went on, um, but doesn't fall out of a, a, a traditional narrow boxed accountability kind of uh, top-down mentality. And this is a source of lots of debate. I mean, uh, uh, evaluation is a, a field of, of many different perspectives, and people disagree vehemently about these things. And, and um, I get the fun of sometimes engaging in those debates, um, which are uh, on occasion relatively nasty because folks feel deeply about uh, these things. It's about how do we know what truth is? How do we de decide what's real and what's not real? Uh, who gets to, to claim they're doing a good job and making a difference? These are high stakes issues. And so people feel strongly about them and evaluation of whatever kind uh, ends up having to engage those things. So um, let's give you a chance to either caffeinate or sugarate. It sounds like you've got both options out there. And uh, uh, get to the washrooms, and we'll get back together here in, in 15 minutes, share some BC examples, and get to interact some more around what this stuff means. <laughs>